All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second science cafe for the year, which is sponsored by the local chapter of Sigma Xi, the Scientific Honor Society, and the Ohio University uh, Research Division. I'm uh, Howard DeWald, the Vice President of Sigma Xi, and a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Uh, we, uh, I know we've been working towards live captioning um, uh, the videos, um, but for now, at least, we're, we're putting them on YouTube, and you'll be able to, to watch uh, within, I believe, 24 hours is, is, is the goal. Um, if there's anyone that needs any other assistance today, um, please contact me or Roxanne over here, and we'll do what we can to help you. So if you've attended these before, you know that they're interactive cafes, and that we encourage you to ask questions during the cafe, and if you're here in the audience, um, we'll get a microphone to you, and Roxanne will monitor uh, the chat, and we'll then be able to, to handle all, all of the questions. Uh, a couple of, of, uh, of announcements before we do proceed. Uh, the next Science Cafe is March 17th at 5 o'clock in this room be by Professor Andre Grabeau, um, who will be talking about rock and roll and the British invasion and the globalization of rhythm and blues. And then many of you may know we have a, an annual student uh, expo, exposition. This is the 20th anniversary of it. And the deadline for registering is coming up on the 20th, so that's Sunday, the 20th. And if any of you are interested in working and getting paid to help set up or tear down for the expo, please contact right over here, Emily Dengler. And I do have her email address, but I'm sure she'd be willing to give it to you also. So Emily will be here, and if you're interested in, in working at the Expo as the setup and tear down, it would be greatly appreciated. All right, so on to today's presentation. We have Professor Harvey Ballard, Department of Environmental and Plant Biology, for an encore presentation. But it'll be very different, he says, globetrotting for violets. Are you setting up? Oh, is that better? OK, good. Because I tend to wander around in classes. If I stay by the podium, the students will fall asleep. If I move around so that they have to track me with their eyeballs, then they tend to pay more attention. Uh, so th I have to admit uh, that globe trotting is a bit of a uh, false advertising. So I've never been to countries where I couldn't recognize the alphabet, mainly because how would I find the bathroom? Uh, and so uh, mostly I've worked around the Western Hemisphere and done a number of programs and uh, conducted a bit of research in Western and Central Europe and also been uh, on the Canary Islands uh, mostly for entomology work that I did with a, an entomologist looking at grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. But anyway, it sounded like a better title than, you know, I spent some time in the Western Hemisphere and by the way, I also went to Europe and visited the Canary Islands and I couldn't fit that on. Uh, three word titles. So, uh, so these are the three destinations I chose. Uh, I've been to quite a lot of places uh, in my work, and I decided these for me are kind of the most magical uh, for various kinds of reasons. And we're going to start with Hawaii. Oh, I know. How many people have been to Hawaii? Okay, good. How many people have been to Hawaii but got away from Waikiki and the beach? Really? That's impressive. Okay, most people stay on the beach, which I can totally understand. Uh, how many people have been to French Guiana? All right, yep. <laughs> yeah, Morgan, this is back there, and she's the one who's contributed a lot of the slides, and Wayne Chassan, her husband, as well. And we've done a lot of programs together. How many people have been to Bolivia? I know, Morgan. <laughs> it's okay. So, good then I get to share a few uh, vignettes with you that'll be uh, a lot different from maybe what you're uh, familiar with. So I'm going to start with Hawaii. Uh, for biologists, 
who are interested in diversity and evolution. Uh, Hawaii is kind of the poster child for uh, organismic evolution. Uh, one of the main things that you have to keep in mind is Hawaii, as an archipelago, is 1,500 miles or more from every nearby continent landmass. So how the heck did anything ever get there? And that explains a lot of why the uh, organisms there are so odd. Uh, so uh, it appears geologically, and I, I guess there's a little bit of debate about it, but for the most part, what we think is happening is there's a, there's a, a mantle uh, plume that's coming up from the seafloor and creating islands as they go, and that mantle is fixed. And strangely as it may seem, plate tectonics was figured out uh, maybe a century ago. Uh, the, the oceanic plate is rafting like a conveyor belt over that spot of magma. And so as the plate moves a couple of centimeters a year, which doesn't seem like a lot, but over a few million years, hey, it's a lot, uh, that those plumes of lava uh, gradually cool and form new island systems. And I'm gonna step back here and just have you see that you can trace the Hawaiian Islands in a straight line past uh, atolls and then seamounts, which gradually submerge further and further because they're getting more and more eroded, and they go up and subduct under the uh, continental plate of, of Asia and the Aleutian Islands. So it's really uh, a fascinating place. And the, the long and short of it for biologists is we have approximate geologic ages for when the islands arose above the ocean and became inhabitable by colonizing plants and the animals. So I'm gonna take you to two islands. Uh, the big island is pretty famous. Uh, and I'm gonna take you to the, the farthest west, Kauai, which is my favorite, uh, the most rural and the most lush. We're gonna uh, just stop briefly at Kapa. Kapa'au, which was our base camp, and we're gonna visit uh, a cinder cone. We're gonna drive around along the chain of craters road uh, to see what the lava flows are doing because there's always lava coming down the mountain. And then we're gonna stop at Mauna Kea Observatory and Hawaii Volcanoes briefly. So there's a wet side and a dry side to all the islands, and the wet side is the one on the northeast side where the, the ocean currents and the rains come in. Uh, they pile on the rain uh, in the center of the island, and then on the southwest side, basically, it's dry as desert in a lot of places. Uh, so we got a little beach house, uh, not quite beach house, but almost beach house uh, at Kapa'au, and this is the lush part. There were bananas, there were oranges, I think maybe there were coffee beans, I can't remember, and avocados. Uh, this is the second, or the original sculpture of King Kamehameha uh, that was lost as a boat went around the tip of South America originally, and then the sculpture, uh, sculptor ended up making a second one, which is over in Waikiki along the beach, uh, and then they were able to get the first one out, and so it's over, over at uh, Kapa'au. Uh, King Kamehameha was the first one to really mobilize the Hawaiian Islanders and bring independence to Hawaii from uh, a lot of different international rulers. So this is the dry side. Now, if you were with us and you left the bed and breakfast and you went around the, the corner, the, the tip of the Kohala Peninsula, it would often be raining. And then you would get around the corner of the peninsula and within about 10 feet, the rain would absolutely stop. And this is what you see. It's, it's the most abrupt climate transition of ever. Well, I can't even call it a transition. It's like a, an on and off switch. So here's the island's dry side. Uh, a lot of cattle ranching happens here. Uh, and then uh, you see these little cinder cones. These are basically mini extinct volcanoes. Uh, and on those volcanoes uh, are some really weird, weird plants. Some of them are extremely rare. Isodendra and Hosaki. Uh, you don't need to, I won't be uh, testing you on the Latin names. So there's not even a common name for it, except in Hawaiian. And this is a shrub, a violet shrub, and it has a few populations and the rest are extinct. So just about every species in this tiny little genus of about four, uh, four different species are, are endangered in Hawaii or on the brink of extinction. And you can talk about that with a lot of uh, species in Hawaii. So we're uh, driving now around the uh, chain of craters Road, 
on the east, southeast side of the island, and they constantly, you can go on the web and find the current status of what the road's like given the lava flows, and you know, every week they have to go out with bulldozers and clean the road, uh, and, and so this, uh, it was closed when we were there early on, and then it had opened up and we were finally able to drive out. So if you look, some of that is dirt behind that car, and the rest of it is actually steam from the lava that's still cooling. Uh, so pretty interesting. And then the lava is going out to the ocean and, and creating more Big Island at the moment. Uh, up on the top is where the lava comes from, so there's a huge crater on uh, Mauna Kea, uh, and, and the Volcanoes National Park. It smells like rotten eggs because there's a lot of sulfur, and of course you don't want to fall in there or you might become soup for something. Uh, now what happens with some of the lava in some places on Hawaii is that the top surface of the lava cools and forms a skin, and the molten lava continues through and then creates what amounts to a, a reverse hot dog. Uh, and so the, the magma finishes flowing through, leaves a hole, and then you get these weird lava tubes around different parts of, of the Hawaiian Islands. So here we had a, a, a package tour from a hostel that we were staying at. They took us through a lava tube. What makes the lava tubes really interesting is that there are weird uh, critters, uh, insects that have been found nowhere else in the world. Uh, a few plants grow there uh, because it's moist and uh, a weird, uh, comfortable environment for them. And then uh, paleontologists have discovered fossils of uh, extinct uh, flightless birds and other animals that were around prior to the Polynesian migration uh, that formed the Hawaiian Island culture. Uh, and uh, they think that uh, right around the time the, the, the original Polynesians moved into the islands, those went extinct. So it's really kind of cool, uh, a very strange environment that has a lot of biological significance. And then if you happen to get on the tour too, you can sign up to go to Mauna Kea uh, Summit Observatories. Uh, this is the summit uh, above the clouds most of the time. There are 24 telescope observatories uh, that had been administered and built by a bunch of different countries. Uh, and so you can go there in an evening. You can see the sun westering uh, with some of the uh, telescope observatories. That's Mauna Kea. That's actually the highest point uh, that is untouched because it's sacred uh, to the islanders. And then there are a handful of altars or ahu that the islanders have built in order to provide offerings to the god uh, Mana. And then also you get these odd plants. So this is one of the famous Hawaiian silver swords that grows up to eight or 10 feet tall when it's in flower. So we're gonna to switch to the, the westernmost uh, public avail uh, publicly available island, Kauai. Uh, this is, as I said, my favorite. Uh, the pace here is much slower, much more rural, much more lush because it's had a chance to, uh, to weather as far as the peaks go, uh, but still pretty rugged. Uh, you fly into Lihue, which I didn't even mark, uh, and then you immediately find someplace else if you can. Kapa'a is a nice village to go to. Uh, it's laid back, it's kind of quirky, uh, reminds me of a minuscule Athens. Uh, has some nice places to stay. Uh, and then because the road does not continue on the northwest side, that's the Nepali coast, the road does not go there, it's a national park. Uh, you can go up and over, or you can go down, over, and up uh, to get around. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go up to uh, Limahuli Botanical Garden first. Are there any questions so far? I'm going, I feel like I'm doing a lecture and speeding through the material. Okay, that's good. There'll be a test. Uh, so Kapa'a is right on the beach, uh, and it really is a, a, a really cool little village. Uh, you can walk around. Uh, we rent, I don't know, Morgan, I was thinking that we got double bedrooms for like $45 in 2001. I, I went on the web and checked some of these. Uh, somebody bought it a little while ago and renovated it, and now they're $700 a night. So we're not staying there anymore. Uh, Unless the university wants to kick in. Okay, oh crap, okay. So I guess we'll sleep on the beach. Um, uh, here you can often see some of the local fishermen getting their food for the day. Uh, and there are feral chickens all over the place. You just kind of have to get used to hearing roosters calling at 4 a.m., it's very annoying. Uh, we're gonna take off and we're gonna drive around the island. Now, this is Google, Google Maps. You have to remember Google Maps does not factor in humans. 
this road is a two-lane road, and it gets worse the farther you go north and west until you get to Hanalei. And remember, there are like boatloads of people at all times of the year there, so you really need to basically account for two hours and lots of stops, and you can't be impatient. You just can't. Uh, but then it ends at the Limahuli Botanical Garden and Preserve, and after that, uh, you go by foot if you want to go to the Nepali coast. So Limahuli, Limahuli Botanical Garden is a wonderful place because of the botanical gardens in the network across Hawaii, and there's one in Florida called the Kampong. Their sole objective especially is to cultivate endangered plants of Hawaii and attempt to maintain them to reintroduce them to the wilds if the habitats become suitable again. So what you need to remember in Hawaii is that Hawaii hurricanes pass through Hawaii about once every 10 years. When they go through, not only do they cause horrible human damage, but they slough off a lot of the cliffside vegetation and can damage a lot of the very uh, rare and fragile uh, communities that are in other parts of the island. So some of these plants basically uh, number a few individuals in the wild and they are otherwise extinct. So Limahuli does that. The other thing that they've gotten into in the last uh, couple of dozen years is to help educate people on how traditional taro farming was done and is now being done uh, by the Hawaiian Islanders. Uh, taro is an important starch crop. Every culture in the world has some kind of a starch crop. Ours is French fries. Uh, the Andes is French fries, uh, rice in the lowlands, and so forth. The taro is a, is a common Pacific starch crop. So taro farming has become uh, more and more popular, and they kind of help take the lead on educating people about that. These are some of the plants. Uh, of, an, it, Hawaiian lobelia, which is almost extinct in the wild now. This thing, which is called, when I first saw it, I thought, that looks like a cabbage on a stick. And it turns out that's the common name, cabbage on a stick. Uh, and I don't know if you can see the flowers, but they have a really long tube, about 15 to 20 centimeters long. And uh, a researcher, a young researcher, just recently started studying it for the floral traits uh, because there was a debate among biologists about whether there's an insect that can even pollinate this thing. They haven't seen any kind of insect on the plants that are still on the cliff sides uh, in a couple of islands for many decades. So this thing is not able to reproduce. I hope you can see me, Kevin. I've got a question yeah. from the audience. They want to know, on these islands, oh. Ooh. <laughs> how did the plants get there? Oh, good question. So uh, researchers have been spending quite a few decades, and especially with the advent of DNA, access to DNA markers, uh, we have some good answers for a lot of the plant groups. Uh, Biologists figured out that of the 1,800 native plants in Hawaii that live there, they arose from about 270 different colonists, original colonists that were able to get there and then also survive. And then a lot of them diversified into whole lineages of plants that are only found on, on Hawaiian islands. The, the main ways that uh, biologists have interpreted those organisms got there is birds, either in them, or on them, so think mud or guts, uh, drifting uh, on the ocean uh, waves, not too many do that. Uh, a lot of times seeds will get caught in the feathers of birds too, uh, and wind. So those are the main ways that uh, organisms get to the islands. Now, the, the other thing about oceanic islands like the Hawaiian Islands is that they very rarely, if ever, have bigger mammals or other animals. So there are no native reptiles or amphibians on the islands. Uh, there are no, uh, birds got there, and there are all sorts of you know, diverse lineages of birds. There are a lot of weird insects there. So uh, some of the biologists call the, the organisms biota of these oceanic islands disharmonic, which means there, they, there are a lot of plant groups and animal groups that never made it there just because of the lack of opportunity for dispersal. Whereas if you looked at islands closer to the continental land mass, there would be representation of, of most or all organism groups. So, so read about, if you want to, read about the cabbage on the stick. Uh, uh, quite a, for quite a few decades, and, uh, these things have been found on the cliffs of Oahu and Kauai and Niihau, which is a, a not public island uh, further west. and, uh, and Botanists have had to repel down and literally hand pollinate these things because the insect pollinators have not been 
uh, rediscovered in, in decades. So uh, we're going to head up to uh, Waimea Canyon and beyond. So that means a long drive. And again, Google, <laughs> God bless Google Maps, says an hour and 22 minutes. And that's driving at the speed that you don't want to be driving on some of these roads. So figure three hours, because that's really how long it takes. Waimea Canyon, I, I had never seen the Grand Canyon before I went to Waimea Canyon. And it's impressive all by itself. It's this gigantic erosional feature. And honestly, it looked like all the postcards I'd ever seen about the Grand Canyon, just maybe not as deep and wide. So um, we went, uh, we drove up the, the road there, and what do you think? I mean, I'd say that's pretty darn impressive. Um, uh, and also dry like the Grand Canyon. Again, maybe not as deep, but pretty spectacular. Uh, and there are a lot of plants and the animals that have evolved to be adapted to those drier conditions, including, oh my gosh, look, it's a woody violet. All right, you're not very excited, but I'm pretty excited. So what you don't know is that in the Hawaiian Islands, nine out of the 10 species of violets in Hawaii are woody. Uh, most of the most primitive violets in the world, basically in South America, are woody, uh, or kind of woody. So uh, that actually led a lot of folks to say, OK, the Hawaiian violets must be very ancient. And with our DNA data, what we found is these things are actually most closely related to an Arctic tundra bog violet complex. Uh, and then we started doing more work and worked out that tundra bog birds, like the golden plover and the wandering tattler, do you love those names, uh, and the ruddy thigh curlew, I think, uh, they, they arrive in Hawaii by the millions in, the, in the, the off season. They breed in the Arctic in the summer, and they arrive in Hawaii and point south later. And those would probably have been birds to uh, carry the seeds of, of the ancestor to the Hawaiian Islands. So Harvey, when you found this, how long had you been looking? Was this just one, or were there a whole field? Um... If you get down on your hands and knees and kind of wander around, you can find some fair-sized, uh, what, maybe 10, 20, 30 plants in the area. It's been, it's been widely uh, recorded on this island and three other islands going east. So it's not that it's necessarily rare, but you, know, you don't think of looking for a, a shrub or a tree lit. And sometimes it gets, they, they get gnawed down to a stumps by whatever kinds of critters. So this is the last, and, and I think one of, them of the most spectacular areas in the Hawaiian Islands. This is really, to me, what wild Hawaii is, uh, going up to the highlands. So a lot of the lowlands have been decimated uh, by uh, human residential development, agriculture, and invasive plants. Uh, you got to get up past uh, Waimea Canyon. Uh, you get through Kokei State Park. You can actually, I think there, you still rent cabins in Kokei. Uh, and so that's the trail. And what I didn't want to tell our students when we were there, uh, when Morgan and I were there, is that you actually had to park a mile and a half further west because they'd blocked off the road for some reason. And I didn't tell them that it's actually a five mile hike one way to get through up onto the boardwalk and go all the way to uh, Kilohana Lookout. But you know, what they don't know can't hurt them, right? So, uh, and I never told them afterwards either. Um, so anyway, it was a ton more. <laughs> I was kind of exhausted. But. So this is the beginning of the Alakai Swamp Trail. Uh, Nene's, uh, I did a little bit of reading about them. Uh, before Captain Cook arrived, uh, there was an estimate of about 25,000 birds. When, uh, after Captain Cook arrived, by 1950, there were 30. So predation, humans, invasive species, and almost annihilated the birds. And then a reintroduction program brought them back to about 2,500 pairs. Uh, they're re actually related, according to DNA evidence, to the Canadian goose up in the Arctic. Also, see, this theme that you don't think about is north, potentially northern Arctic things getting to Hawaii, but evolving under tropical conditions so they look like they have tropical ancestors. So, and it has kind of a uh, almost embarrassing honk. It's high pitched and kind of weak and hang, hang. Uh, but, but you can tell that it's a Canadian goose uh, uh, to some extent. And uh, as you're walking along the trail, uh, you can see the knife edge ridges. Anybody see Jurassic Park? Who hasn't seen Jurassic Park? So the knife edge ridges of the island in one of the earlier movies that was filmed on the Nepali coast. So pretty amazing. People have found 
uh, snail, whole snail groups of species on those knife edge ridges. And I think, okay, snails, they don't move more than about two feet in their entire lifetime, so those ridges would keep them separate and they would, of course, evolve pretty fast. Uh, this is rigorous hiking. So I, I actually have seen one or two uh, women go in on stiletto heels. I don't see how they could possibly do that. Like I'm struggling with regular boots. Uh, and if it rains, which it does rain most of the time, it turns to chocolate pudding. And, and it's incredibly, wouldn't you say it's pretty, it's pretty vigorous. I mean, you're climbing, trying to pull yourself up vegetation. The trail is not that great until you get on the boardwalk. And then wouldn't your heels fall through the boardwalk cracks? Anyway, it's very strange. Uh, Morgan uh, led a lot of uh, stream ecology studies and uh, found some really interesting algae with uh, uh, one of the postdocs from the University of Hawaii there. Uh, and then there were all sorts of plants, uh, and I'm not going to talk about them, but uh, so pretty diverse. Uh, again, lots of amazing uh, viewpoints. And then you finally burst out onto the, well, slump, pulling yourself out onto the boardwalk. Uh, so there's, there's basically a couple of miles of boardwalk you still have to walk to get to the other side. Uh, but this is the high elevation bog with swamp forest surrounding it. So this is where you really see some of the last vestiges of wild Hawaii. Uh, there are lots of species that only grow here uh, and nowhere else on the islands. So there, there are species that uh, only occur otherwise in New Zealand and Australia, growing next to sundews, which occur in boreal North America and Europe, uh, growing next to things from Asia. It's just the weirdest thing. Uh, quite remarkable. And more violets. So there's actually a species of bog violet that will only grow in the open and on the very edges of the swamp forest scrub. And then there's another violet, Viola violina lie. What, why, why Lino and I, took me like six months to figure out how to pronounce that, uh, and it will only grow in the swamp forest. And you can find hybrids every so often where the two species come together in the, the edges, but that's it. So pretty amazing. And where does all the water come from? I mean, this is a huge watershed. It comes from the mountain side, or the mountain tip, right in the center of the island, where the average rainfall is 31 feet. So I don't want to hear any complaints about how wet it is in Athens. It's kind of amazing. I can't even imagine 31 feet. OK. So we're going to take a, we're going to take a detour to French Guiana. Uh, this, is one of the, this is one of the places where uh, Morgan and I were talking about our next destination when we first started creating these short-term field courses. And she said, well, I studied French in college, so I think we should go to a French-speaking country. And we were like, where do they speak French in Latin America? I know French Guiana. <laughs> so that's how we picked it. And it turned out to be an amazing place, uh, incredibly, incredibly diverse. And just to the west of it, that's, if you've ever heard of Tapuis, that's where the Tapuis are in Venezuela and a little bit of, of British Guiana. Well, not British Guiana anymore. So this is, this is where most of the publicly available land is right along the edge of the coast. Uh, you can get little roads in a little bit, a uh, little ways, but basically if you don't have a plane, and they don't really run very often, I think I remember checking, it's practically never, then you have to hire, getting on a dugout canoe with some of the local tribes, and you travel in for a day or two and you might get further in. Uh, and so we stayed in Cayenne, and then we uh, made a day trip to Cacao, which is a, an immigrant Laotian village. Uh, and then we traveled to San Loren de, Mar de Maroni. I always want to call it macaroni for some reason. And then we actually had a couple of days to, a few days to go down to Chutes Voltaire uh, to a little ecotourist lodge in the middle of the rainforest. So this is Cayenne. It's really weird. Uh, it's kind of like a tiny bit of Paris transported to tropical rainforest, South America. Uh, we were watching these people go walk along the sidewalk in clothes that you would want to go to a beautiful club with. There were creperies, the people were speaking French. I mean, I don't think I ever heard anybody speak Spanish there at all. And I don't know that I ever saw a North American. So tip for travel. This is a good place to go if you don't want to see North Americans. Uh, it's a great place to go. Uh, and then uh, Wayne pointed out the, the anableps. I remember the name anableps. They have four eyes. So they have, two, uh, they have their eyes divided into four segments, which is really cool. If you're a fish, it's, it's kind of neat. Uh, Morgan and I had gone to other places, and we were desperate to find cacao trees just because we thought that we should get pictures of cacao, and we never managed to find them. So 
uh, I came out one morning, we had to get something from the car and, uh, where we were staying in Cayenne, and I looked in front of the car and there was a cacao tree. It hadn't been planted, it was just growing there all by itself. So I ran and grabbed Morgan and we finally got pictures of it. So this is where your chocolate comes from. We should bow down to it and uh, offer prayers. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a big deal. And cacao is everywhere in, in South America. Uh, uh, they, uh, Morgan had a sophisticated algae processing lab in, in, our, in our rooms. They're actually very comfortable rooms. Uh, so Cayenne was our base camp. Now we're going to head to cacao. What you need to remember about French Guiana is that it, although it seems like it's its own country, it's actually a metropolitan department of Paris, and it's administered as such. Uh, if you've ever read, I guess there's a book called Papillon, and, and that uh, it's, the author talked about being incarcerated in the penal colonies that were there as of the middle of the last century. Uh, but in a sense, it's kind of the French's uh, secret tropical paradise. So, <laughs> and it's really pretty amazing. Uh, you can drive around, and here there was this wooden ca uh, church that looked like a little castle uh, that had uh, services uh, certain times of the day. This is looking out over the northern part of French Guiana. You can see that the elevation is about 10 feet. Uh, it's, it's not very dramatic. It's less than Florida, I think, until you get to the very far south where you get a little bit of uh, what are called inselberg. Uh, inselbergs. They're kind of tapui wannabes. Uh, so go down to Cacao, fabulous rainforest. You stop the, the car next to the road, you go in three feet, and you have blue morphos, you've got amazing streams with all sorts of red, freshwater red algae, uh, you've got monkeys, you've got all sorts of you know, living things. It's, it's pretty astonishing. I've been to other uh, Amazonian basin areas, and I, to me, this is like, this is the choice one. You go to French Guiana if you want to see real rainforest. So cacao, uh, it was an interesting little village. Uh, there was handmade jewelry. Uh, they had insects that they had collected from local rainforest and put in frames. If you want to take something back, might be Cydes endangered. I don't think you would want to do that. Uh, and what I also found intriguing is the, the tapestries uh, tell stories about their families, their origins, legends from Laos. Uh, so that was really cool. And then there was an insectarium where they had a lot of other insects that had been collected from the local forests and also garnered from other uh, collectors from around the world. And there were, uh, <laughs> did, you, did you bully Wayne into holding the tarantula? I can't remember how that happened, but he wasn't happy. He, he's looking like he's smiling, but I think he's, and then look at the guy with the bugged eyes. He's, he's obviously not into that either. Uh, and they had, a, they had a small boa that was really cute. Uh, it was very harmless. So we traveled around French Guiana, uh, the northern parts. Oh yeah, go ahead. Somebody wants to know, besides the insectarium, did you actually run across critters when you were out hiking? Um, my problem is, is I'm a botanist, so it takes me an hour to move more than 10 feet. I mean, seriously, you know, we'll get on our hands and knees and look at some scruffy little fern, and then, you know, by then, all of the animals within a, a league of us have already departed. Uh, I've seen butterflies, you know, the monkeys were pretty obvious. Um, when uh, Morgan and I had done the reconnaissance for the French Guiana trip, uh, we were, I remember that was when we discovered at night that we were, had both had bad night vision. Uh, we'd driven like 50 miles along this road and it ended in this chewed up place where, that uh, logging trucks had gotten stuck in and it was like five times bigger than this room and there were no outlets. And then it was getting dark and I turned to Morgan and I said, well, I don't really have good night vision. I hope you, you can drive us out. And she said, oh dear. Uh, so, and then our way back, we ran into an, uh, an, uh, a, a boa constrictor that looked about eight or 10 feet, but it was dead. Uh, it was off to the side of the road. A logging truck had apparently run it over. So there are a lot of critters out there. You just have to maybe not be a botanist and you'll see more of them. Uh, just a few things that are characteristic of what I call rainforest syndromes. So a lot of the trees in the rainforest, in the tropical forest, are going to have buttresses because most soils of tropical systems are very thin and the bedrock is close to the surface. That's because the soils themselves actually have a lot of the organic matter going right up into the, into the forest vegetation. It's, it's consumed very rapidly. Remember, high temperatures, a lot of moisture, everything's getting consumed. So the, a lot of trees have evolved 
putting out these huge buttresses to stabilize themselves against falling over. And then there are a lot of uh, forest giants. I think this is a big saba tree, a gigantic kapok tree. Uh, and the other thing that you think of is uh, when you go to the tropics, which we don't have here, we have grapevines and poison ivy and is there anything else that is like a woody vine? Down there, up to 30 to 35% of the species diversity in the tropical rainforest is in epiphytes. So bromeliads and orchids and cacti and ferns and, uh, and dozens of other plant groups live only in the canopy. So it, it's a different kind of world. And if, you're, if you want to learn how to treat, climb trees as a researcher, that's a really cool skill to have because that's where the action is ecologically these days. Uh, so the thing that looks like a fungus is actually a flowering plant. It's a total root parasite, so it has no ability to make its own food. Shrimp plant, a lot of plants in the tropical rainforest actually produce ant houses or domatia. So if ants are on the plant, they will stimulate the plant to actually enlarge an area the ant can drill a hole into that area and form a little condominium. And the benefit to the plant is that the ants can live there, and if something disturbs the bush, and I can tell you it's happened, uh, then they're going to boil out and cover the invader. Uh, so the ants get uh, you know, the benefit of the domicile, and then the plants get the protection of the ants. So it's very effective. Hot lips, I, don't, I always think of Mick Jagger when I see that. I don't know why. Um, and then there we are standing around, Heliconia. If you've never thought about ferns being aggressive, this is an aggressive fern. Its favorite place is eroded roadside banks. And I've seen this thing every tropical place I've ever been, including the Hawaii. So it's a, it's a really widespread and very successful fern. Uh, there was a big spike moss. Usually the spike mosses that we have around here are little tiny creepy things. This is uh, three or four feet tall sometimes, and it was iridescent, so you could see it across the rainforest floor. It's really cool. Uh, capers, I don't know if, you're a, if you are a Haudi cuisine kind of person, you might have heard, eaten capers. They're the fruits of that. There's a pineapple, filmy fern. It's in a, a, a couple of families of ferns that have leaves that are only one cell thick. Uh, and then these are the innards of Brazil nuts. I don't know if you've ever seen Brazil nuts, but once they get pollinated, they lose their innards, <laughs> except for the part that makes the nut. And that's what those are. Those are a bunch of male reproductive structures all fused together. And there are violets. Look at these. These are crazy. So Amphorox is a canopy tree that gets a foot to a foot and a half in diameter, uh, trunk-wise, and then will go up 30 to 40 feet. So that was really exciting. Uh, we managed to get a few branches of that by using a Costa Rican botanist technique of shooting a, what was it? It was a flexible chainsaw blade that we tied to a string and used a slingshot, not very effectively, to get the branch down. Uh -huh. Good, different, different, uh, uh, different genera or species groups. So these are actually all trees, and in the violet family, the most primitive groups in the violet family are all trees, shrubs, and vines. Mm -hmm. So the little herbaceous things that you're familiar with, viola, uh, are actually a, a weird derivative. I mean, it seems like the you know, most common and widespread thing to us, but it's actually a weird derivative that's made it into the temperate regions and up into the mountains. So this is just, this is really cool to me. Uh, and maybe one other person is, thinks it is too. Uh, so as we were driving from Cayenne West to saint laurent de Maroni, if that's how you say it, uh, we happened to see this church. And we stopped and went in. And it turns out this was a church where the prisoners at the penal colonies were brought in, the ones that showed artistic talent, and they made frescoes. It's a pretty amazing, it's a pretty amazing thing. They, they, they created elaborate frescoes in this church over a period of, I don't know, decades or something like that. Uh, and then there's the, the defunct uh, prison buildings there. From uh, Saint Laurent, we, uh, we managed to make contact with a guy uh, at Chutes Voltaire. So this, thing, this guy uh, has a little lodge in the middle of nowhere. And the only way to get to it is to ride his truck, basically, or get on a timber truck, which, of course, we couldn't do. And the only way to reach him was on Wednesday nights from 7 to 8, because he only had a satellite phone, and that's the only time he could make it work. But when we got there, we didn't know how to get in touch with him. We went to the bakery. I don't know how we ended up at the bakery. Maybe for breakfast or something? And we, do you know? 
Oh, okay. I was kind of helping not to mention that. <laughs> I'm all about food, I can't help it, but especially baked goods. Uh, so yeah, we went to the bakery, and then we happened to mention, well, I, I don't speak French, so Morgan and Wayne were mentioning in French about, you know, we were hoping to hear from this guy. And she said, oh, just stay here, because he'll be here in an hour. He always comes on uh, Wednesday mornings to get his bread stuff for the restaurant. Uh, and so I think we either waited, or uh, he came down, and there was his truck, and so he took us up. Uh, and uh, Morgan is, it looks like Morgan's smiling, but I don't think Morgan is smiling. I think she's grimacing, because this was a really rough road. Uh, and I don't think that it would pass any kind of legal standards uh, elsewhere. Um, and it was, it was like, I felt like two or three hours of steady driving on this really bad road, a logging road, essentially. And then we finally got out. After people got out of the truck, they were like, their legs were jiggly and thought people were going to keel over. But there's the, there's the hostel. It's kind of a hostel. Um, they, they made uh, separate uh, cabanas, or I don't know what you call them, uh, out, of, out of the local uh, fern stuff uh, to thatch, thatch, thatch the roofs, and they made walls, and, and it, was, it was delightful. Uh, and the guy actually would go out into the rainforest and catch some of the local uh, game and make, make supper. Uh, so and there were people from all over the world there. Uh, mainly Europeans and, and Australians and other folks. Uh, this dog was an evil creature. If you got within like 20 or 30 feet of him, he would just stare at you and start growling. And the closer you got, the more terrifying he sounded, like Cujo or something. And so I just hated that dog, and I didn't really ever trust him. Uh, in the morning, there's so much moisture uh, that uh, when the sun comes up and it heats the roofs of these things, it's steam, of course. So it was just kind of a pretty situation. And so I don't know why we thought it was amazing, but that's rain in the rainforest. Why didn't we think that was amazing? Anyway, it was pretty amazing. The question is, when you said that he went out and captured creatures to eat, yep. what did you eat? I had capybara. I had a goody in Cayenne, so those are two kinds of, I think, rodents or raccoon representatives. Um, uh, I know some people had fish. Uh, do you remember what you had, Morgan? Uh, yeah, Cayenne was very good. They had, like, I think they had armadillo. Armadillo, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, to them, that's just kind of average, normal, you know, chicken. Tastes like chicken. Uh, but <laughs> but it, was, it, was, it was pretty wild. Uh, and it was really good. I mean, you know, they were, they were really good cooks. And, uh, of course, because we stopped by streams and there were streams everywhere, man, you found all sorts of algae. You've got a lot of Batrachospermum. So Morgan's a freshwater red algal specialist, uh, one of a handful in the world. And, and every, everywhere we went, every stream we got, I think it had something really interesting. That tells me I got it. Okay, stop. Shut up. Thank you. So uh, just to tell you that we do see animals when we go, even though we don't know that they're animals, so they're bats and heliconius butterflies. Uh, we saw a few monkeys, uh, a lizard and, and turtles. Uh, one of the drivers that was taking us around uh, pulled out his machete, and I was worried for just a split second, and then he pulled out pine, uh, coconuts and, and, uh, and hacked off the coconuts. So here we had a chance to, uh, oh yeah, here I am. So, and here's another animal thing. So what you've got to remember is this is a quick time movie. So this is three times normal speed. And this giant tree sloth had fallen out of a tree somewhere and was trying desperately to cross this road. And there are huge timber trucks and cars going everywhere. And we're terrified it's going to get smattered. Uh, and, uh, and it looks like a, it's the size of a sheepdog. And it looks like somebody took carpet and glued onto a sheepdog. It, I mean, uh, its mother probably appreciates it. but. It was. So I'm going to take you to Bolivia now. So are we doing OK on time? OK. Uh, to me, this is one of the most amazing places because you not only have Amazonian basin rainforest at sea level or below, uh, but then you have the Andes going up to the Andes. And then you have this huge plain at about 4,000 meters, 12,000 feet, called the Altiplano. So you have this ridiculous range of temperature extremes and climatic regimes. And 
people have adapted to live in all those areas. So there's the Altiplano. It, it's, uh, it uh, stretches over three, three countries. It's huge. That's what the high cold desert looks like. Uh, so here's, the, here's a map. Uh, we've got La Paz, that's our kind of home base. And uh, we're gonna take a, a, a few day trip up to Sarata, which is kind of nestled in the higher elevation Andes. So off the, off the Altiplano, but in the higher elevation Andes. And then we're gonna come back and we're gonna take a week and go down to Coruico, which is subtropical. And then our last few days, we're gonna go over to Copa, Copacabana. This is not Barry Manilow's Copacabana, I assure you. Uh, and to hang out on Lake Titicaca. What's crazy about La Paz is it's seven miles long and it sits in a trough between the Altiplano and the flanks of the Andes. So it's just this really odd place. And here you can see this is a little tiny bit of La Paz and it just stretches out. If you're poor, you get stuck in the bottom. If you're more affluent, you get a, a nicer place up higher on the mountain top. The Institute of Ecology, where the Herbarium Plant Museum was, uh, is on one of the higher areas. And of course, right outside is a soccer field, because every town in Latin America has a soccer field, if not many of them. So we're heading to Serrata, uh, and we've driven, we've gone past Titicaca. Uh, Huayna Potosi is one of the favorite mountain climbing areas. So if you're an, uh, if you're an avid adventure person, then you should go to Bolivia to check out the mountain climbing. You should go to Bolivia to check out the whitewater rafting because all of that's amazing. The hiking is amazing. Uh, and, and it's one of the cheapest places to go, speaking as a traveler, that I've ever been in, in uh, Latin America or, or otherwise. So here we're coming into the Andes. We're, we're off the Altiplano. Uh, and we're hunting for Serrata. We're trying to figure out which of these villages in the middle of the mountains is Serrata. And finally, our, our uh, uh, Bolivian grad student guide. Oh, she was a botanist. I can't remember. Uh, and there's Sarata in the middle of the high mountains. So uh, we're, we're making day trips uh, from a little hostel that we rented uh, rooms at. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is basically to hire somebody with a truck. So we'd find somebody with a truck and say, we'll give you 50 bucks to just drive around for the day. And that's what they did. Uh, and so you can see there pretending to be excited, but mostly to get out of the truck. Uh, and we saw all sorts of streams. So remember, you know, the mountains are just cascading with water everywhere. Uh, this is not nearly as cold as the, uh, as the high elevation Altiplano. Um, so uh, we don't have very, very many pictures because we we're busy actually studying the plants and, uh, and the algae. Uh, and so another trip that we're making is to Coroico. This is the subtropical area. It's halfway down the Andes. Before we got there, up until recently, uh, they had closed the road because, I probably shouldn't say this, but it's 20 years, so uh, statute of limitations have passed. So because buses and cars were falling off the mountainside, the road wasn't really good. Uh, and then they decided, uh, they, they, they fixed the road, and then they were, opened it on one side, and then finally they opened it on uh, both sides again. So we felt very safe. Uh, and we got on a bus. Uh, we, got, we took a, a hired bus. Uh, what worried me is as we were kind of coming off uh, the, the highest pass going down the mountains, the driver, I don't even know he stopped. I think he just pulled out the grain alcohol and said a prayer in Spanish and then took a swig and splashed some on the dash. He said that's a, you know, a traditional thing. And I was kind of more worried about you know, his driving watching him drive. Uh, but anyway, we, got, we went down the, the, this, this uh, series of switchbacks. There are 30 switchbacks, 30 switchbacks going down to Coroico. And uh, one of the guys uh, didn't like heights, and so he actually cowered on the floor of the bus. I felt so bad for him because the scenery was spectacular. It was just amazing. So we go from high and dry and cold in the highest passes down to low and moist and warm subtropical Coroico. Uh, anybody want to try to guess what this center one is? Small cocoa plantation. So in the mid-elevations and higher elevations, a lot of the locals grow coca for their own use. And this is where uh, I think of a uh, you know, dilemma comes in because the locals use coca. It has the same kick as basically a good cup of coffee. Uh, and they may chew it, 
uh, and it gives them uh, uh, relief from headaches, high altitude, because they get high altitude sickness too, headaches and uh, nausea, uh, and gives them a bit of energy. Uh, and so, you know, that's that. Uh, the problem comes in when uh, other people decide to uh, refine it for other properties and concentrate it 1,000 or 10,000 times beyond what locals would ever use it. And then, you know, then you got cocaine and you have problems. So it's, just, it's a really interesting cultural thing. But the, uh, the locals have been doing this for many thousands of years. This is where we stayed. Uh, I want to say we paid $12 a night for the rooms, and it probably wasn't worth more than that. But, uh, but they were fine. And then that's actually had a pool. Uh, there are bananas and coffee and Boonville and all the tropical things you would imagine, oranges, stuff like that, were growing in the immediate area. Uh, lots of, again, more streams for, uh, for hunting for algae. Uh, just a very lush green landscape and uh, quite rugged again because we're still in the, in the middle of the Andes. Uh, we had a number of, uh, a couple of Bol Bolivian grad students with us to, to do sampling and, and study algae with, uh, with Morgan and the group. Uh, so that was our kind of our short stay. So I would highly recommend Coroico as being a very different kind of atmosphere or environment than the high elevation Andes. I'm going to stop just for a moment and give you uh, two slides from, uh, not from the, this particular trip. Uh, a few years later, I took the dad, my dad as a research grunt with me to uh, Guatemala, Ecuador, and Bolivia uh, because I, you know, he needed to get out of the house and I needed his help. And so I'm just going to show you a handful of slides that are uh, going to portray a little more about typical uh, Latin American life. So uh, every town, every town, no matter how small, has adopted the Mediterranean routine of open air courtyards uh, and town squares. So every, every place in every village has a town square, if not more of them, more than one. Uh, and then also, because the climate is so nice most of the year, a lot of homes and restaurants and, uh, and hotels have open air courtyards, which we in the temperate region kind of can't do. Uh, but they take it for granted because everything is good. Can you see the toucans? So there were a couple of resident toucans where my dad and I had a, I had a room at the hostel. They were very chatty too. Uh, when, I, when dad went with me to Ecuador, here he is. He's trying to you know, be secretive, uh, but he stands like six to 10 inches taller than any of the locals at 5'4", I should say. Uh, so here we're in an uh, in in open air market. So it's another thing where I think, oh yeah, you know, we're getting really good at having uh, uh, markets, farmers markets. But they've been doing this for centuries or thousands of years. Uh, so it's a very standard procedure in a lot of Latin America uh, to have open air markets. And that's how most people get their stuff. I remember in Ecuador, I went out of our hotel one morning at about 6.30 to get some fresh air before we went for breakfast. And I looked over, and this middle-aged guy was literally carrying a full-size refrigerator on his back, walking up the sidewalk to go to the market. I thought, OK, that's more dedication than I think I'm really willing to put into. Uh, there was a side trip that we made to uh, Unduavi uh, when Morgan and I were there. Uh, there was a yam. I decided not, uh, not to get really close to him. Uh, and Stefan, Stefan Beck, uh, a world famous botanist of Bolivian plants, uh, went with us and then he showed us how to identify some of the high elevation plants there. So we were studying plants and uh, Morgan was finding other cool algae and doing water chemistry. Lots of streams everywhere. Get ready, here it comes. Ah, Viola pygmaea. So one of, the, one of the 135 species of violets in the Andes. It's a special group that only grows in the higher elevation Andes. Do you have a question? Sure. Do it. Okay, I'm just going to keep on going. I only have a handful of slides. This is Copacabana. So I think by the third week, Morgan and I were so exhausted taking 24 students around Bolivia that we kind of, I didn't take very many pictures, and I don't think you did either. So there's just a handful of things. But this is Lake Titicaca. So uh, there's a ferry crossing, which seems straightforward, except uh, everybody drives their, oh, here's what you want to pay attention to. So you can see it's landlocked. This peninsula that has Copacabana, Bolivia, is landlocked. 
the Peruvians don't like them to come over that. So, so the way to get to Copacabana is you drive to the end of the road, and then you have to take a ferry with whatever vehicles you got, and then you drive over to Copacabana. And that seemed perfectly logical. Except the, the bus drives onto this barge, and as the bus was driving onto the barge, I looked down in the bottom and noticed there was no bottom. The bus drove onto planks, and there were like big holes in the bottom of the barge. Uh, and then the people get on speedboats, and they go across the, the bay. So as we were going across with the, with the speedboat driver, I asked in Spanish, just as a joke, are there very many buses at the bottom of the channel? And he said, with a straight face, not many. And I decided not to ask any more questions. <laughs> so there were crossing. Unfortunately, we don't have many pictures of Copacabana, but it, it's a pretty famous tourist destination. It's a beautiful little village. Uh, it's right on Lake Titicaca. That's Peru across the, across the bay. We managed to get to the tip of the peninsula, walking along that Inca uh, there's an, a famous Incan road that's still around, and we took the ferry up to Isla del Sol. This is the legendary birthplace the Incas believed was where they originated. Uh, so it's this cool little island with lots of terraces. And this is uh, a traditionally dressed Andean woman. Different tribes in the Andes have different uh, color patterns and different patterns of how they wear their clothing with multiple aprons and stuff. But it's very typical. And you can see she's kind of a short person because they all are in the Andes pretty much. And she's got an alpaca, which is a bit the higher elevation version of the yama. So that was, that was really cool. Uh, and following the advice of the, our Bolivian guides, we first asked if we were allowed to take a picture because a lot of the folks are superstitious that the camera is capturing parts of their soul. So you have to ask people. And then if they say yes, it's also a tradition to give them a little monetary gratitude. Uh, so we gave her a nickel, and that was that. Um, I'm just going to put this up here because if you're a student and you haven't done any study abroad, you need to go talk with those people immediately. If you're a faculty member and you haven't led any international courses, you need to talk with the Office of Global Opportunities to find out how you can do that. Um, I've been fortunate to do 16 short-term field courses and help to direct or co-direct three longer-term ones. And I can tell you that it has really changed my life in lots of different ways. And I'm not going to tell you because I want you to figure it out for yourself. Uh, so at that point, I'm just going to release you from bondage and, and let you ask questions. As I walk over, I just have to make a comment. We have uh, funded a lot of your research through the research division. And yes, you have. Your proposal is the only one where the committee decided, give him more money. We're afraid he's not spending enough money on his hotels and food. That's what the National Science <laughs> Foundation said about my first proposal. I asked it for $79,000, and they felt so sorry for me that they said, well, we'll come up with pocket change for that. So that's what they did. So I have a, a question about the plants in Hawaii. And you uh -huh. showed us in the beginning where the ages of the islands are kind of one or a few million years old. Is the right way to think about that, that most of those plants have been there much longer than that, and they colonized islands many, many millions of years ago that have now sunk back into the, the ocean? Or are they? You're so clever. So we used to think that that put a, a limit of time on how old the lineages would be that started in Hawaii. And there's something called a progression rule. It's just kind of a rule of thumb that any plant or animal lineage that got started in Hawaii obviously must have started in Kauai. And then gradually hopscotched eastward as more islands came up above the ocean. There have been more than a couple of studies to use molecular markers and molecular dating that found out those lineages predate Kauai by about 10 million years. <laughs> and that there's no reason to really assume that Kauai was the, only, the first one in the Hawaiian island chain to be colonized. So I think more and more people are doing sophisticated analyses with fossil dating and discovering that Kauai isn't the only first you know, likely candidate. For some groups also, like the there are Hawaiian drosophilas, there are 450 species. And uh, an old guy, I shouldn't say old because I'm old now, a guy 
who studied drosophilas using salivary gland chromosomes actually worked out their evolution and said, no, it's not Kauai as the oldest place, it's Maui. And they radiated going west and east after they got to Maui. Uh, and I think molecular data have supported his conclusion. So you're right. It's, it's like making an assumption, and we know what assume does to all of us. And I'll just throw in their Drosophila fruit fly, right? Got that right? OK, good. All right. Other questions? We have time for one more. All right. Then I think we're going to have to thank Dr. Harvey Ballard so much. Thank you. I don't know about you all, but I haven't been able to get out of Athens in a long time, and this helped. <laughs> Thanks for coming.